Set in a fallen world wrecked by demons yonks ago, the last of humanity has been reduced to a single, isolated village. It's here in seclusion that the remainder of mankind, now composed entirely of weeaboos, dedicated their lives to studying the blade. Over decades, this effectively converted the population on a one-to-one -one basis into actual badass ninjas. So now, you being a young shinobi who regularly skives from class, decide to call out the village elder on how all this hiding and prophecy nonsense is utter bullshit. Which, of course, triggers the demons into immediately start invading, if only to make you look like a complete bellend in front of all your mates. Fortunately, a samurai shows up to backhand these freaks, and since they're working on a very tight schedule, the demons decide to leg it and return in another 500 years or whatever. Then, this western hero tasks you with carrying a magic scroll to the top of the highest mountain to dab on these demonic invaders, figuring you're the guy best suited for the job after meeting the sole prerequisite of being the only one in town able to maintain a vertical orientation. So at this point, you best get on your bike mate, cause you got a lot of linear platforming to do. Now while the premise of The Messenger is pretty straightforward, it'll still manage to blindside you occasionally, even if you did watch the trailer beforehand, especially once you reach the mid-game point and it opens up into a Metroidvania from time shenanigans. Until then, it remains a linear action platformer that's very much like Ninja Gaiden, except for the small but noticeable distinction that it's actually doable. The platforming and combat itself is super tight and responsive, handling well and feeling smooth to control, along with the hitboxes being pretty precise which is especially good when you're busy outrunning a buzzsaw skimming your cheeks. While the game starts out as basically easy mode for the first couple of levels, the curve in difficulty is fairly consistent and never suddenly spikes to the point of wanting to toss your controller across the room in a raging fit. The consequences for dying equates to basically a slap on the wrist with it chucking you back to the last checkpoint and having a little red imp boy following you around who will suck up any time shards you pick up preventing you from collecting fat stacks until he decides you're even, he gets bored or scared shitless and fucks off. Even then you'll be accumulating time shards at such a rate that this doesn't really matter and you'll be looking for new money sinks once you've bought all the upgrades. Speaking of which, many of the usual ones are present, with you being able to cloud step from the start, although you have to work for this double jump by either smacking enemies, lanterns, or later on projectiles if you buy the corresponding upgrade, because you're just not quite ninja enough until you can propel yourself through the air by deflecting a fireball. This also means that you can remain airborne indefinitely, provided you have something to act as an outlet for your aggressions. Then there's more staple abilities like wall climbing, gliding from heights, and the grappling hook that they make the very clear distinction that it's a rope dart, thank you very much. These are all handed out as they become convenient to advancing the story, whilst others are purchased from the shopkeeper, like increasing your maximum health, gaining the ability to toss shurikens around, or somehow willing your enemies to drop green orbs to replenish your hit points. Not quite sure how that works, but seems legit. One or two you happen to find, like the lightfoot tabbies that'll let you walk on surfaces like water, mud, and even lava, so long as you keep moving, but only on some designated surfaces and not others. Which you can and cannot is left for you to find out. In a world overcome by demons, and with humanity rendered to less than a dozen on-screen NPCs, you'd expect the survivors of this hellscape to become bitter and desperate. However, that's where you'd be mistaken. Instead, as some kind of coping mechanism, everyone seems to have mastered the art of sass and will shut you down if you dare open your stupid mouth to try and talk back, you reprobate. Like the shopkeeper, who doesn't look like a shopkeeper. Either way, whether it's repeatedly trying to touch his cabinet, like you own the place, or bugging him for stories that he'll gladly indulge you with several pages worth of unadulterated text, except for when he doesn't. He's also not shy of actively calling you out for procrastinating from your epic quest and scolding you like your mother should have done. However, he's not an unsympathetic man, for he will still freely dispense advice or hand out much needed items when they're direly needed. All of this is way more than your elder will ever do for you, being too busy talking smack to your face or tricking you into performing botany so he can get high off his balls. Fuck you and your astral leaves, old man. Along the way, you'll also come across some other sketchy characters that'll leave you questioning your lot in life. Like the dumbest pair of pseudo-intellectual ogre dude bros, some Kirby crossover phobkins who are glorified mandatory collectibles, Ruxton, a good skelly boy who didn't do nothing, and Manfred, a dragon who wants nothing more than to be a butler. He also turns out to be your best bro as you engage in shmup-style sky adventures that come out of absolutely nowhere. 
The whole adventure is supplemented with funny dialogue and writing to help make up for just how light and silly the story is. Not being shy in making fun of itself or other games, nor being exactly subtle when it comes to referencing the fact either. Usually, when an indie game starts relying on meta humor, it's a cause for concern and is used as a crutch to fall back on. Here though, it personally won me over fairly quickly and was well executed in just how absurd everything was. It's no wonder why this game was published by the Meme Lords at Devolver Digital. As for the levels, the layout of the stages for the first portion of the game has been designed to flow really well, having enemy placements strategically dot around in such a way to encourage being a turtle ninja badass and rarely touching the floor as you bounce around off the top of monsters and projectiles near enough non-stop. The design and obstacles start out fairly basic, but gradually pick up in complexity with each stage, slowly introducing new dangers with each one you play through all the while having plentiful checkpoints to avoid having long, arduous gauntlets where you're scraping by with a single point of health trying desperately to reach a save point. Each area varies from one another and steadily demands more competency from the player in navigating each stage to avoid an ever-growing supply of death pits, spike traps, and falling stalactites. The stages are rather pretty to look at and easy to read, so there's rarely an issue of making out what you can and can't climb onto. There may be the odd instance of mistaking a death pit for a secret path leading to another area, or mistaking which surfaces your lightfoot tabby can walk on, but these are fairly rare occurrences that happen few and far between. The aesthetics of each stage vary from interesting locations like flying civilizations and chilly mountains with precarious ledges to grapple onto, to the more cliché staples like lava world and catacombs. Yeah, okay guy, just because you lampshade it doesn't make you not guilty. Anyway, whilst not all of them are exactly inspired, they do go out of their way to include some pretty dank ones later on during your adventure, like the Underwater Shrine and Riviera Turquoise for your Donkey Kong barrel blasting needs. The enemies you'll encounter through these levels are usually the same variations of Michael Bay Turtles on either Weed or Speed, or Rockman who look like they're rocking out to some fed beatsies. Do you mind dropping some fed beatsies? Otherwise, there are usually some reskin of one of the regular suspects, like fireball spitting gargoyles, bats, because of course there are, spooky scary skeletons, Metroid and Mega Man wall clingers, Medusa since you haven't suffered enough, and Mario creepypasta shrooms. Once you've passed what's basically the first act of the game, it'll open up significantly, finally introducing its big gimmick. That being, after some time shenanigans and getting a sick hat that makes people mad jelly, you're able to travel back and forth between the future and the present, as can be visually represented by the art style shifting from pseudo 8-bit all the way up to pseudo 16-bit. Big graphics. As a mechanic, it's pretty cool and well implemented for the most part, having portals and rifts in time that you can go through to open up previously closed off areas and access branching paths to places you couldn't reach before, as well as interacting with fireflies that'll give a limited area around them that faces into the other timeline which all becomes necessary to progress in some parts. At this point, you're tasked with collecting the plot devices needed to elbow drop the demon army once and for all. On the one hand, this effectively doubles up the levels you've been through as a remix since it's branching levels atop of pre-existing ones. On the other, this means you're going to have to figure out which portal you need to enter to access which path from which direction, which, without the upgrade that displays them on your map, can be really confusing. So this, plus the fact that there's only so many portals to certain stages from the hub area, so you're going to be speedrunning from Autumn Hills to Ninja Village at least four times like an absolute mad lad, because they decided just to not put one in the town itself for some reason. You get to open up a couple more closed off portals once you reach them by foot from the other side the first time around, but the number of them just feels too few and spread out between one another. It all serves to make the middle to late game drag a bit and feel like padding as you run around like a headless chicken trying to find all the hidden tokens needed to complete the game. At least your shopkeeper is willing to accept bribes to tell you which zone they're in just despite his cult bro. What a guy. Most, but not all stages feature a boss fight, usually involving their own game mechanics necessary to combat them effectively. The Leaf Boy serving as a tutorial boss that appropriately a stiff breeze could beat, with subsequent bosses getting a lot more tricky like the duel against the golem spirit while you glide around inside of a wind tunnel. Barring the first couple of encounters, most are pretty challenging and memorable, relying on you to competently use your platforming skills to get into a smackdown range of their weak points for massive damage. 
introducing more dangerous attacks, damaging hazards, or reliance on other game mechanics to overcome each enemy. While a few can definitely be pretty hard if you don't spend time studying their rhythm, others you can abuse the AI to get in a free win. Like Bomber Fazil just standing around like a smug asshole whenever you toss shurikens at him, so you can just bash his face in while occasionally giving him a token projectile to block like you're handing a dog a treat. I'm about to end this guy's whole career. The sound design matches the duality of levels, having not only unique tracks for every stage, but a future and present version, using different quality instruments that suit the aesthetics of each section you're playing through. They also flawlessly weave in and out of each version whenever you traverse through portals, and it's only made better by the fact that every track is really catchy and great to listen to. All of it is really amazing, and you can buy the album off of Steam. There's also the added detail of music and sounds being muffled out when underwater, and the ability to swap out music tracks once you unlock the jukebox, which again is a boon when you're stuck revisiting the same stage for the umpteenth time from all that backtracking. Taking this into consideration, along with how much of an action platforming veteran you are, and how much you care about 100% in the game, you could expect a 10 to 15 hour playtime, with following playthroughs probably coming in at about half that long. After the main game is over and done with, you can move on to New Game Plus, which gives the difficulty of enemies and boss fights, while starting with all your previously unlocked upgrades, as well as giving you the choice of which key item to pick from the start, letting you tailor your playthrough and access certain areas earlier than you could have otherwise. Alternatively, you can play through the first DLC, which unlocks after completing the campaign. With this, you get to go on a much needed holiday and relax after saving the world. Only, of course, that's exactly how things don't turn out, so you've got to smack around some familiar faces along with some new ones before you can settle down for some nice fun in the sun. Featuring some sick sea surfing, new stages, a mix of old and new enemies, including some new mechanics and some challenging boss fights. While by no means earth-shattering, it has some funny moments, interesting monsters, and tacks on another 2-4 hours of decent action platforming onto an already good base game experience. And all this with a low, low price of free. There's really little to complain about. So overall, I give The Messenger a rating of a shinobi out of Ninja Gaiden. You can find it for sale on both Nintendo Switch and Steam, and I highly recommend anyone able to tolerate more than a little silliness in their time-traveling action platformers to try it out. Thanks for watching, and have a good one.